It's the radio guy, Mike Prince from the Open Mic Broadcast Network. We have a very special treat for those of you who have joined us on today. Of course, you know we come to you each and every day right here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. As promised, we are delivering the head man in charge, not only for the Jacksonville State, the Gamecocks, not the Dolphins, for the news that's been traveling around. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But he is the chairman of the FCS football playoff selection. We want to present to some and introduce to others none other than Mr. Greg Seitz. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on, Mike. Well, we appreciate you making yourself available. Uh, I guess before we get into the football selection process, you probably got a lot of mix-up phone calls here of late uh, with the news coming from Jacksonville about their latest news about dropping football immediately. That's been a little bit of confusion that way, huh? Well, there is. You know, there's really three schools. There's uh, uh, us, Jacksonville State University, and then you have Jacksonville University of Florida, and then Jacksonville State in Mississippi. So I know that we get different calls, and uh, mail sometimes gets mixed up. So uh, I can assure all your listeners that the Jacksonville State Gamecocks will be playing football next season. <laughs> Okay, then we got all of that uh, out of the way. Um, as always, uh, when it comes to a process of selection, you guys just uh, got into you head into the second week of the playoffs from the FCS. And let me make a special side note here. A lot of people say that your playoff structure is the right way that FBS should be taking notes. But there's always going to be uh, a method to the madness and some hurt feelings at the end of the day, huh? Yeah, you know, that, that's uh, that's probably the unfortunate thing of the selection. Is there's always going to be, you know, three or four teams that felt like they had done enough to get selected in. Um, you know, and it's just, it, it's hard when you get down. We got those 14 at large teams and, you know, Mike, the first 10 are really easy. It's those last four are the ones that are really difficult because there's probably just one minor thing that the committee probably felt like gave the edge over one team or another. Okay, is there a particular formula that you guys go by, or is it more of a gut feeling, or uh, I know you look at the overall body of work, but what is the actual absolute science to getting that done? Yeah, so we do, we, we really do look at the, you know, entire body of work, and so once we get to those last, probably 14 teams, you know, um, certainly we, we talk about all the pieces of the things that may make a team that looks better over another one to the committee's eyes is, you know, certainly we look at the overall win-loss record. We look at head-to-head -head competition. We look at common opponents and how they did. We look at their strength of schedule. Then we have a uh, formula that uh, the NCAA committee uses it's called the SRS formula, and it's really our football RPI formula. So, I mean, we have a lot of tools that we look at, but, for example, this year, like South Carolina State was team just right there on the bubble and we had a lot of discussion about them and specifically on them there were just a couple of deciding factors they were not ranked in the coaches top 25 poll which is one of our uh, tools that we use and they were not ranked in our regional advisory poll until the final weekend and they had a low strength of schedule but you know they did have some wins over Walford who was in the final discussions and who made the field and I think the committee just felt like for them, there was just some other teams that had a better box work with the SRS and some schedule. So there are a lot of factors that go into, um, you know, as we're looking at what we call scrubbing and analyzing those final teams. Right. And when you, when you go back to the South Carolina State uh, concern, uh, a lot of people would say, well, they beat Wofford, who at that time was in the top 10, I believe top five of the FCS rankings. And uh, they had a, I guess a comparable schedule or strength of schedule compared to some of the other schools who made it in. And um, they, they were figuring that, Hey, you, you beat one of the guys who are in the upper echelon that should have counted, you know, maybe a little extra in their advantage. I don't know how that, that goes, but that's, that's the, I guess the, the word around town. Yeah. And you're exactly right. So just so just to give your listeners a, a quick view. So there's 10 athletic directors that are on the committee. So each, each athletic director, uh, they all come from the automatic qualifying conferences. So each person on the committee, Mike, you know, they may value one of the things differently than the other. And so in order for a team to get selected, they must have 70% of the vote. So 
seven out of the ten uh, folks have to select that team to get in. So, for example, for and, and I'm just making this as hypothetical, but for you know, for me, maybe I rank um, you know those wins over Walford a little higher than another community member, or that um, you know that their two losses were really really close. I mean, they were less than if my memory serves me right, like three points. So they were very competitive and into those games. But it's really you know it, it's an art. It's not a science and with those ten individuals, they, you know, we people view things differently. So that's why uh, I love I love our setup because we do have ten people to go in and, and vote. So it's not like one person can control the entire community. Each each uh, person has their own vote and decides what's important to them and they're making their election. Okay, we're talking right now with Greg Seitz, uh FCS committee chair for the football playoffs. You know, it is always, as we say, a delicate situation. Right now, we happen to be talking about some of the teams who are on the outside looking in, in particular that of South Carolina State from the MEAC. Um, we know that there is a unique situation when it comes to the MEAC and the SWAC. Uh, the SWAC has a championship game, and then there's the Bayou Classic between Grambling and the uh, uh, Southern Jaguars. And uh, so does that factor in as far as the top teams from those the divisions or is there what how much does it weigh in that you're looking at possibly a number three a number fourth rank school from those particular conferences yeah so uh, that, that's a great question and when certainly we know that the winners of both of those conferences are going to play in the celebration mode and then the swag is a little different because they actually do have some games scheduled on our first round weekend and so you know some of those teams may not be available to compete in our championship However, at the end of the day, though, um, but all of those teams are eligible for our championship, and, um, you know, we've had some teams, I know when Hampton was a member of the MEAC, they got an at-large a couple of years ago, and South Carolina State this year was just right there on the edge. Uh, this year, there really wasn't any SWAC teams that were available to play, uh, you know, that will be in our uh, final discussion at the end of the day, but certainly they had some good teams as well this year. Now, uh, when it comes to um, the playoffs, it's almost like a bidding process for hosting the playoffs in the FCS. Can you explain exactly how that works? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the host is actually the very last thing that the committee does. So the first, our first thing we're going to do is we're going to confirm the 10 automatic qualifiers. Then we're going to select the next best 14 teams. And then what we're, the next one we're going to do is we're going to do the bracketing process of it. So just just a quick um, just a quick note on our bracketing. The way that the NCA has some very strict guidelines and policies on our bracketing, and what they want to do is they want to limit flight. So the policy is that if you can drive to one of the opponents within 400 miles, that uh, that will save the flight. So we're going to pair those two teams up. So this year in the first round with the rest, we had five games that were drivable that first round, so which meant there were only uh, six other teams that would, uh, that would fly. So we go ahead and set the pairings up, and then the very last thing we do is when we, that's when we decide who will host it. So we have quality of facility is really number one, and there is a, uh, then we, open, then we look at, take a look at the bids and see how those are impacted, and past hosts, uh, certainly if you host in the past, that will come into our discussion. So. The host is actually the very last thing that we do as we're, uh, you know, once we get the bracket set, then we look at the side on the host. And, uh, you spoke about the 10 automatic bids and then the 14 at large bids, but it's got to be somewhat difficult when one of your said schools are on that bubble. How do you guys handle that? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. And so what happens is, is the, let's use, for example, the two committee members who teams were Hakeman Field, and that would be Montana and Nickel State. And so any time that we, we are talking about a team whose athletic director or administration that they represent is in the room, they actually have to step out of the room and stay out of the room so that the other committee members can talk open and freely about the discussions on their team. Uh, and then so when we'll bring them back in, and they're able to provide factual information about their team. For example, they may tell us that, okay, we had an injury in the second quarter of a game, which uh, we ended up losing by two points. But beyond that, they're not able to provide any other information uh, on their team. And then as we get into the, 
bracketing portion of the bracket, um, those committee members whose teams have been selected to the 2014 field, they're actually out of the room, and the other committee members that are in the room will do the bracketing uh, just to ensure that, um, just for the open transparency, to ensure that you know they're not able to manipulate that bracket, and it's really for the protection of the school that they represent, right? Just because we know how passionate FCS fans are, and we don't want them to come back, and we certainly don't want the NCA to feel like that, um, you know, hey, this this athletic director was able to manipulate where they didn't have to play the number one overall seed. So that way, they're out of the room the whole time, and they're not involved at all. In so, bottom line, trying to keep the integrity of the selection from beginning to end of the process. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yes, sir. Now, I have one other little deal. When it comes to the bidding, and uh, when do you start accepting bids? Is this after the fact they've been selected or when, like, say, your top eight got an idea that they're going to be one of the uh, top upper echelon uh, selections? Do they start putting their bids in or when does that window open up? Yeah, so that's, a, so that's a great point. So the BF portal always opens up the last week of October, and then it closes on Monday at 5 p.m. of the final game week. So if your final game is, is played on Saturday, November the 20th, the bids are due the Monday prior to that. So it's a, it's a set date each year, but it's always the Monday prior to your final home game or final game of the season. Okay, and so with that being said, uh, all of this, when the dust settles, uh, it's about a profit and margin. When you are putting up the X amount of dollars and then you compare to the attendance that happens, does that bring any about concern for the FCS playoffs or you just uh, the game must go on? Yeah, so, so there, there are minimum bids that the host is required to meet for each round. So uh, the first round, it's a $30,000 bid. Round two, it's $40,000. Uh, then the quarterfinals, it goes up to 50, and the semifinals, to 60,000. So let's just say, you know, a school, that's the minimum. It's certainly some schools that are, uh, you know, will have much larger bids, depending on how they draw from a crowd standpoint. But let's just say that, um, you know, you have two schools that are just very, very close there on their bid, and then we know what the minimums are. Then we're going to look at the things that I discussed earlier, like uh, quality of facility, and, you know, if your team hotels are right there in the city or does the, does the visiting team have to commute, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, that's something that the committee would look at and take into account uh, if you've hosted in the past, uh, how that works. But uh, there is a financial component. I mean, I'm not, you know, that, that is certainly, uh, you know, a factor in it, but there are also other factors beyond it. Absolutely. So um, if you got the hotel accommodations, I'm, and I'm hearing, I'm trying to uh, recap and summarize that part. Within, I guess, 45 miles or 40 mi 45 minutes closer, that would be a strong draw versus to the opposite, being away. Yeah, it would. So let's just say that, um, let's just say like the Stanford in Birmingham, Alabama was, you know, they had put a bid in and say for whatever, say the uh, Auburn, Alabama game is going on. And so there, were, there was not a visiting hotel located within Birmingham and they would have had to stay uh, you know say an hour away whereas if, and if the team that they were playing let's say it's Chattanooga Chattanooga had hotels right there in downtown it was only five miles away that would be something that the community would look at and consider uh, you know as one of our determining factors to host. okay now it, and it's always I can imagine that during this time that you got a bunch of people lobbying and saying, "Hey, this is why you ought to look at us." But from gathering what I've gotten learned from you today, if you are uh, playing a very let's say um, uh, select non-conference opponent with some quality wins and you handle your business in conference, you increase your opportunities of being part of the e elite twenty-four. Oh yeah, absolutely. You're you're 100 percent right. So so schools, right? They have no control over their conference schedule, right? So really, the only thing they control is their out of conference schedule. This year was unique because we had the opportunity to play 12 games. But in a normal football year, you really you only get to play 11. So let's say most conferences play an eight-game conference schedule, so that leaves you three out of conference opportunities. Now we know. Uh, with the level we're at, a lot of teams are going to play up and play that FBS opponent. So 
the community really, unless you beat that FBS opponent, we don't we don't hold an FBS loss against any team because certainly we understand the financial, um, you know, what that brings to each school. So then that's going to leave you two other out of conference opponents. So um, it's very important for teams to schedule an FCS game. Um, you know, in those other two games. But if you play a non-D1 game, say you play a Division II or NAI, the committee looked at that as, although you didn't even play that game, because, uh, you know, our kind of our standard is if you, if you have less than six Division One wins, that could put a team in jeopardy of being uh, selected for playoffs. So this year with 12 games, you know, um, we just didn't, you know, we had a, we didn't have a six-win team in the field this year because you had those 12 game opportunities, so we did have a couple of seven win teams. Uh, but they all had to be Division One wins. And this year we only had three FB, FCS over FBS wins uh, in the league in Central Arkansas, and that was honestly, they beat Western Kentucky, and that was kind of one of the reasons that they ended up getting one of those coveted top eight national seeds was that they did have that FBS win. You know, they beat Western Kentucky, who is so eligible with seven wins, and, and, and it's probably the best FBS win of the three this year. No doubt about it. So um, if, you, if you're listening out there and you're in the FCS ranks, get you a beatable, uh, a credible FBS school to help increase your odds of making that uh, select 24. Uh, once again, we're talking right now with Greg Seitz. How many times have you been called Seats? <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, right now, uh, we're talking about the FCS playoffs. It's an exciting time of year, and I know you guys are getting uh, anxious, and it is, it's hard to be in that position uh, when you have to make these selections, and part of the leadership role is you got to take the heat that comes with the luxuries of this thing sometime, huh? Yeah, you really do. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that the committee is made up of 10 athletic directors from the automatic qualifying conferences. So we're really the experts of our own league. So for me, I represent the Ohio Valley Conference because that's the team that Jackson, that's the conference that Jackson State plays in. And then I have a secondary conference. So for me this year, it was the Southland Conference. So I would always provide the committee information on the Ohio Valley Conference and then once the Southland Conference primary representative spoke, then I would I would talk up and say, okay, well, this is, I talked to the commissioner earlier this week, and, uh, for example, say the Southeast quarterback got hurt and missed the last half, and that's the reason that they may have lost this game or whatever. Of course, we want the committee to be as informed as possible and as knowledgeable on all the teams across the country as we get into play. Right, because I can imagine if you're playing the role of athletic director, you're so in, involved in your actual program that you have to get the notes and as precise notes as possible to make a clear conscious decision. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So I'll just run you briefly through through what a normal week is for us. So beginning about week six of the football season, on Monday mornings we have what we call regional advisory calls. So for there are four regions across the country. So for me, I'm in the central region, which includes the Missouri Valley the Ohio Valley, and the Pioneer League. And so every Monday morning we get on and we talk about um, the teams, and, and, and I talk about the Ohio Valley Conference team, and then the Missouri Valley folks will talk about theirs, and then the Pioneer Conference will talk about theirs. So there's uh, a national committee member uh, that is on each rack, and then there's one additional representative from each conference. So for us, since we have three conferences in our rack, there's a total of six folks. And so then we go in and we rank our own rack, and then uh, the south does that, and the central, uh, the east, and the west would do that. And then on Tuesday morning, we will have a national call. And so we're provided those regional rankings from the racks on Monday, and then we go through, and we'll spend, oh, about an hour and a half or two hours every Tuesday going through and talking about every conference. So we'll, we'll go through and talk about all, all ten of the automatic qualifying conferences, and then we'll talk about the MEAC and the SWAG, and, of course, the Ivy does not compete in the championship, so we don't have any discussion there, and then we'll have some independent teams. So, like this year, for example, North Dakota is competing as an independent, and so they are... Played it in the west rack of the town. So, so once we get all those in, 
and the committee goes in and we do a top 25 ranking. And then we get another call on Wednesday for about 15, 20 minutes and we go through and say, okay, here's, here was our, here was the committee's decision on the top 25 teams or is there any uh, adjustments or anything we're going to look at that we think we got it right this week. And so we know that that's going to change each week because there's teams compete throughout the year. They're so playing different opponents and they're, you know, continuing to win and, uh, or lose in, in, the, in our top 25 ranking would change, you know, every week on that. Uh, it's very similar to what the college football playoff, except they make theirs public, uh, whereas we, we do one uh, public reveal usually uh, around the week of October 30th, which is three weeks out from selection, and then uh, then we don't do another public release until the actual selection Sunday. Now, is there a method behind why you do it like that, or it just keeps, keeps the heat off until later dates? No, the reason that we do the public race is we really, you know, at that point in time, you know, it's just how the committee feels like the, the top ten teams are faring at that time. And it, and it kind of gives the FCS community an idea of, okay, at this point, here's what the committee is thinking. So, you know, if you're if you, if you're ranked fifth in that first top ten, feel like you've got a really good chance of getting one of those top eight national seeds. And if you're down there at, at nine or ten in that first review, and uh, then you know you got a chance. Hey, we got a chance to get up there and get one of those eight top seeds. So it's really just to educate the FCS community and to generate uh, talking points and interest on FCS football. So in NASCAR terminology, it's the waving of the flag to let you know we're headed into the final lap. Yeah, that's a, that's a great analogy. <laughs> yes, sir. We're talking with Greg Sites of the FCS Bowl selection. Now, we know that there's a cause and effect. You notice we hadn't said much about FBS because it's all about FCS right about now. But there is a domino effect that what happens up trickles down. And I don't know what your position is uh, for not only the FCS as a whole, but as an athletic director at Jacksonville State with this pay to play that has been passed. How do you see that affecting the FCS in the long run? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's all so new to us that, uh, you know, we really had not an opportunity to, to wrap our hands around it for me personally here at Jacksonville State. I know that it will have an impact. I think the thing that uh, this uh, association and FCS football, what we've got to be careful of is, you know, when, when are those payments going to be made? Is it, you know, at the end of their career? Uh, and, and how that, and, and make sure that we get the right structure in there because, you know, at the end of the day, they are still student athletes and amateurism. And, we don't want to have um, folks abuse that system, um, you know, so we, I think we just got to find out the correct way to get that implemented and how we can execute With that being said, um, when you talk about the cause and effect on it, with uh, the latest, going back to your, one of your neighboring schools, Jacksonville, they weighed the checks and balances, did a 15-month study, and they just decided that it wasn't worth what they were investing do you see other FCS and some of those Group 5 uh, programs possibly saying, hey, we're hitting a glass ceiling, so we need to start sh trimming back on what we're investing in football in particular? Yeah, you know, once you get beyond the Power 5 school, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, at our level, I mean, football is a major investment for a lot of institutions. And so, um, you know, there is... You know, if you're having declining enrollment, and if you're having, you know, if your team hasn't fared very well, and you're and it's on the revenue side, you're having a hard time uh, generating enough money. I think most people would realize that, you know, at our level, we're not, you know, we're not operating as a flag uh, on college football. I think every school is, is a little different, and they'll just have to take a look at it. But uh, it would not surprise to see me some schools that may be in scholarships and you know, have not been very successful over the last several years. They may drop the scholarships, because that is probably, you know, that's our largest cost to each school is the scholarship dollars. Uh, you know, so we have 63 scholarships that we can spread out over 85 players. So, you know, that's by far our largest uh, expense in football. Well, there is an old terminology, Mr. Seitz, and it's called Robin Peter to pay Paul. And when you get to that terminology, when you're trying to have a balancing act of your books, something goes lacking. And then for the overall effectiveness of student athletes across the board, 
uh, tough decisions like this have to be made. And what's scary to me, I think this could be the beginning of a mild phenomenon with other FCS programs. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly wouldn't wouldn't uh, surprise me one bit. You know, we're always, you know, I think people realize that when you know when they had that uh, when we had that split between the Power Five and the others, you know that you know well there won't really be a gap. I mean, even if you look at the SEC, there's still a financial gap right between schools. I mean, you're going to have Texas A&M and Alabama, you know, generating almost two hundred million dollars in revenue, but then you're going to have some schools like Mississippi State and Ole Miss. They just don't have the fan base, so they're you know they're generating maybe a hundred, a hundred and ten million. So you know there is still a gap of eighty to ninety million dollars even among SEC schools. And obviously that gets compounded when you look at some of the schools that aren't generating the revenue as those power five. And it is very expensive to operate football. I mean, there's no question about that. Well, it almost makes you wonder, as we mentioned, is it worth the investment or do you go with a whole different approach and say, hey, here's our glass ceiling and here's how we're going to operate and possibly even create a new way of doing things on the FCS level. Yeah, and I think I think you make some great points there, and I think as we uh, work through and navigate through this um, pay-to-play model that you had mentioned over the next couple of years, that you know each institution will have to look at it and decide, hey, okay, what what's important to us, and how are we going to be able to continue to operate at the level that we've been operating over the last ten years? Well, I tell you what, sir, I know we're stretched for time right now. You have been a trooper uh, from beginning to the end of this interview. And I want to appreciate and thank you for making yourself available. But also, we have a custom here uh, that we allow our guests to have some closing thoughts and comments, and I'll turn the floor over to you right now. Well, Mike, I do appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and, and talk with you. And I'm just excited to see how the playoffs are going to play out. You know, I think most folks think that it's a given that North Dakota State and James Madison are going to meet in Frisco at the end of the year. But... Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily uh, sure that's true because that's the reason we line up and we see upsets each week. And when the playoffs, uh, you know, get rolling this week with the second round and the next week in the quarterfinals, you just never know a team could have an injury early on and could impact the end of the game. So I'm just excited to see which two teams are going to make it to Frisco and, uh, and just looking forward to an exciting championship. Well, it's always exciting for the potential upset. To be honest with you, that's what excites me about playoffs across the board. Who will be the upset king this week? And we'll keep our eyes glued and keep people informed as it unfolds. I want to thank you again, sir, for making yourself available. We will thank those who have joined in on today's episode of the Mike Prince Show. Of course, our social media handles for Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are at the Mike Prince Show. The YouTube channel is Open Mic Broadcast Network. And our website is obnradio.com with the 24-hour dial-in message line at 713-570-6736. I've run out of time for today, but until the next time, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.